And here in this uh, next um, half an hour, do you see my screen? Yeah, everyone sees the screen? I believe um, you do. So I wanted to show you in this half an hour um, the main entomological indicators, a bit of the guidelines that the guidance documents that WHO has. Lucia, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you make it bigger? Is it possible? Um, yeah, I think that, okay, let me stop sharing and share the other screen, share screen two. Uh, and there we go. Is that better? Is it better now? Is, it, is this yes, in the perfect. display? Yeah. yeah, it's better. I think we can see. Go okay. ahead. All right. <laughs> perfect. So just wanted to show you uh, first um, the documents that WHO has. Um, is it? Let me see if this is working. There we go. Um, so documents that WHO has to support um, countries to conduct uh, entomological surveillance for malaria. Most of the things that I will be saying to today are related to malaria, although the digital collection tools can be used for both uh, dengue or ar arboviruses in general and, and malaria. So I just wanted to show you here that there is this key document that you see is currently under review, which is called Malaria Surveillance Monitoring and Evaluation. And it's a, a manual where we are providing guidance on how to conduct malaria surveillance. And there is a specific chapter, chapter number five, which talks about entomological surveillance and vector control monitoring and evaluation. Uh, currently, if you go into these documents, Lucia, and... sorry again to interrupt. I yeah. think if, we, if you open it in the screen, you know, display screen, and then it will become. I don't see it bigger. I see it only on the side. Uh, if you have it like a no, for... but uh, it's clear from my side. I mean, it's in presentation mode. Really? Oh, then yes. it is in the presentation. Yes. Okay, then maybe something wrong on my side. Sorry about. It. Sorry. Sorry. Is it, do go. you see the full screen or not really? Go ahead, go ahead. I think it's yes, a Yes, we see the full screen. Yeah, yes. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. So yeah, I was saying that there is, so there is this document which has a, a chapter on entomological surveillance and vector control. Uh, and currently you have a list of indicators in there. You have instructions on uh, how to plan, how to implement entomological surveillance. But there is a chapter with an indicators which, are, which is currently being reviewed. So well, what I will present uh, in the next slide is, uh, is work in process. It's not a finalized version of entomological indicators, but it's work in process. It's a summary of the new, um, the new in a sense, the revised indicators, uh, their usefulness for uh, programmatic decision making. Then we have also a few other documents that you may find uh, useful and may have been presented already in this training. Uh, one is the test procedures for insecticide resistance that provides guidance on how to uh, monitor insecticide resistance. And it's also currently under review to incorporate a lot of the new discriminating concentrations and procedures that have been recently developed for new insecticides. Then there is this other document that is also currently being updated, which is a, a practical uh, manual uh, to, to conduct uh, entomological surveillance actually, or, or to investigate our vectors. And this is a very comprehensive manual that includes uh, protocols for lab procedures, et cetera. Then we have the indoor residual spraying, which has a manual on how to implement indoor residual spraying, but also talks a little bit about how to measure, uh, how to evaluate this intervention, which kind of indicators uh, we should try, be trying to measure. And the last one is another one which uh, on, on LLINs, which also provides some information on how to measure, for example, the bioefficacy of LLINs. So we're hopefully, hopefully bringing most uh, of the things you need to know for entomological surveillance into the practical manual. So this revised version will be probably your main reference document if you are in the field. Now I'm gonna go into the, into the entomological indicators. So I have divided them into three groups uh, for this presentation uh, based on the programmatic question. So the green column that you see on the right-hand side. Because um, I think the most relevant thing is we're we are uh, monitoring vectors. We are doing surveillance to respond to questions that we need to respond to plan malaria control interventions or malaria control strategies. So we need to think of always of the usefulness of these indicators, right? What, what do we need to know? What, what are we using this information, this data for? So these indicators, the first set of indicators that are on the screen respond to the question, which vectors should prioritize targeting uh, with uh, my vector control interventions. Um, I'll edit that later, sorry. 
So it's like, um, I need to know which are the vectors of interest, which are the vectors that are transmitting malaria mainly in different parts of my country so that I target them with vector control interventions. Um, and how do I get to know that? No, that's the question. How do I get to know that? I have to implement entomological surveillance and I have to measure certain indicators which are listed here on the left-hand side, which are gonna help me answer different surveillance questions, different questions on my vector population. So the first one is uh, vector occurrence, so I, which helps me understand which are the vectors present in the area. So by measuring occurrence, which is basically saying, okay, I'm gonna check which vectors are present, which vectors are, are absent from different areas of my country, um, so I understand uh, which vectors are there. The second one is species relative abundance. So once you know which vectors are there, we're trying to understand which is the most abundant one, which is the predominant one, right? Which is winning the battle in the, in the field, which is, which is getting, uh, which, which one has a higher, a bigger population. Then we have uh, vector density. That's important because depending on, on the areas of your country, you may have regions with really high transmission, with very high uh, vector densities, and areas with uh, low transmission with very low vector densities, which may make it even difficult to measure these indicators. Because when you have really few mosquitoes, it may be very difficult to get to collect uh, enough numbers to, to actually measure all of these indicators. So it's important to see this relative density. It also helps us uh, to evaluate transmission. Uh, the second one is a sporozoite rate. Um, and with this one, we want to answer the question, which vectors are transmitting human malaria? I may have a lot of anopheles, but some of them may not be transmitting human malaria in my area. So again, it's, it's an indicator that requires collecting quite a lot of mosquitoes to be able to detect the positive ones, uh, mainly in the low transmission areas. Uh, but it's, it's very crucial because it tells us in, which are in fact the, the vectors transmitting malaria, which are the ones we should be targeting with, the, with our interventions. Second, second one, or the next one is the human blood index. So now that I know which are my vectors, which are the most abundant ones, how big is the population of these vectors, uh, and whether they are transmitting human malaria or not, now I need to know how much they bite humans, because those vectors that bite mainly humans will be my main target. Uh, the ones that are biting a, a less uh, humans a bit less may be a less important uh, vector species, also again depending on the transmission levels and and whether we are looking at control or we are looking at elimination, but the vectors that are uh, most more frequently biting humans will be uh, more important in general. Then we have the human biting rate, uh, which is uh, how many bites a person is getting in one night, for example, or in one month, or in one week, or in, or in one year, depending on the time frame we use to, to measure it. Uh, and again, it's also telling us, okay, I know which vectors are infected. I know which ones bite mainly humans, but how many bites people get? Because if people don't get a bite, they won't get malaria. So it's, it's important to measure how many bites they get from different species. The next one is entomological inoculation rate, which is combining our sporozoite rate so with the human biting rate. So here we're looking at how many infective bites, not how many bites in general, it's not how many infective, infective bites. So that's why we have to, to calculate the entomological inoculation rate. We usually multiply the human biting rate, the number of bites per person uh, times the sporozoite rate, the percentage of, that, of those vectors, of that vector species that are actually uh, infected, that contain sporozoites. So this little, this is the set of indicators uh, um, helps us identify where should we focus. So we are gonna plan our vector control interventions to reduce malaria in our country or to eliminate it, which are the vector species we should be targeting. And it will help us identify if these are the same in every corner of the country, or if we have very different ecologies, um, meaning there is different uh, vector species, uh, and the most important ones are different in different regions of, of our country. Any, any quick questions before I go into the next question, into the next programmatic question that entomological indicators will help us uh, answer? I don't want to talk too much because I think if, if we make it interactive, it's gonna be better, you will learn more. Okay. 
I don't see any questions, so I'll continue with the next next question, and then we can we can go to back to to Q and A later. So the next one is easy; has only one indicator, uh, and is which insecticides can I use to control these vectors? And this is related to insecticide resistance uh, that we will be talking about a lot during the sessions today. Um, is like once I know which, which vectors I have to target, how do I do it? Which vector control intervention do I choose? But also which are the insecticides that I could use within these vector control interventions to target these vectors. And that depends on whether the vectors are susceptible to the interventions uh, or not. So monitoring the status, uh, and this is in this line is just talking about presence or absence of resistance. So monitoring the, the presence of ab or absence of resistance in uh, my main vectors will help me uh, understand or, or have a list of insecticides that I could use. And the last question um, is, what kind of interventions do I use? So now I know which vectors should I, should I target, uh, which insecticides I can use, and now I need to think what is the intervention that I could be using, which is, of course, related to, to which vectors I can use. And for this, I, I have listed here three main indicators, three important ones. One is endophagy, the other one endophilia and biting rate. So endophagy um, is going to tell me uh, where vectors bite, right? So we are trying to evaluate here how many vectors um, of a given species. Now, what's the percentage of uh, mosquitoes of a given species that are biting um, indoors versus outdoors? Uh, is my, my vector population in an area mainly indoor biting? If so, then LLINs may, may do a good job because they are mainly indoor biting. People will be covered, people will be protected by, by an LLIN. So they will be effectively protecting people. If there is a lot of outdoor biting, we know we may have a proportion of malaria transmission that we can't prevent using LLINs. So we need to think of other interventions to tackle that proportion of malaria that we won't uh, be able to, to control. The second one is endophily. And this is about where our vectors rest. So endophagy was where the vectors bite. Endophily is what our vectors rest. And this is important because one of our core interventions that I saw that you know really well, uh, IRS and LLINs. Um, so IRS is an intervention that is targeting vectors that are resting indoors because they need to rest on the wall, on the sprayed wall of the house um, to become in contact with the insecticide and die eventually, right? So if they don't rest indoors, they are not going to be exposed to the intervention and they're going to escape and we are, not be, we are not going to be able to control them. So knowing uh, which species mainly rest indoors, if our main species in our areas mainly rest indoors, will help us understand how effective is IRS going to be, right? And what's more or less the proportion of the population that we can control with uh, IRS. And the last one, which is quite important as well, is biting time. And that's very important, um, especially for, for LLINs, because um, we know vectors and anopheles, malaria vectors, by during the night, right? G general statement, they bite during the night. So we have bed nets that are protecting people during the night. Now, uh, there are some moments uh, where they may, may be, may be ve vectors biting, like early evening times, like 6, 6 p.m. or 7 p.m when vectors are already starting to bite and people are not yet under the net. So they are exposed, despite having a net, despite using the net effectively, despite tucking the net very well under their corners of the bed, these people may still be exposed during quite, a, quite some time, depending on their behaviors, on, on human behaviors, to uh, these vectors biting early in the, in the evening, or vectors biting as well uh, in the morning after people have woken up and when they are doing stuff in their houses. So that's, um, that's the other one. So three questions, three programmatic questions that these indicators can help us answer. Which vectors should I target? Which in insecticides I can use to target these vectors? And which are the interventions I could use based on endophagy, endophily, and the biting time of the vectors? In very general terms, there are other indicators as well, but I think this conveys a bit of the main um, uh, idea of the usefulness of these entomological indicators. Um, before moving into the immature stages, into the larvae and pupae uh, related indicators, any questions? I am seeing people commenting on the chat. Yes, there's a couple of questions in the chat box. Yeah. 
Right. So, okay. I say the first question is the proxy. So, yeah, I mentioned I wanted to go more into the methods uh, later with all of you. Uh, so, I'll, I'll let, leave this question for later. The other one, what are criteria for selecting indicators? So, these ones that I presented on the screen are the, the most important ones because there are more indicators, but these are the most important ones. Now, one of the big criteria is going to be resources. It's not easy to measure some of these indicators and we may not have the resources to do it. And for example, I'm gonna give an example. Uh, biting time. For biting time, we need to be able to be collecting mosquitoes in different, uh, in different containers, if we think about traps, or we need to do human landing catches in, in different um, time periods during the night. That is quite time consuming. Uh, human landing catches is not, not very ethical because we are exposing humans to mosquito bites. We can give them malaria prophylaxis, but we know now in this training that there are other mosquitoes transmitting arvo arboviruses for which we don't have prophylaxis at the moment. Uh, so we are putting people at risk when we do human landing catches. So that may not be an acceptable intervention. And the alternatives will be to have either uh, field workers replacing the containers of the traps every one or every two hours during the night, or we need to buy more complicated equipment that automatically moves and, and collects mosquitoes in different bottles uh, throughout the night. So that is quite, quite demanding in terms of resources and we may not be able to do it. So all of these things are important things to know, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a matter of resources in many, in many cases. Then I see another question, which is some settings, LLINs are the first choice for exophagic vectors as they, people sleep outside the rooms in endemic areas and they sleep in rooms during winter. So it cannot be restricted to endophagic ones. It's true, it's true. If you can get people to use, or in some areas, we have also hammocks um, with netting around them. So in those cases, um, you can use LLINs. If people sleep outside and they can use a net, because the problem when people sleep outside is that you have no places to, to tack the net. You have, it's difficult to set up the net on top of the place where they sleep. If they sleep, uh, for example, in a hammock that you can hang somewhere between trees and protect them with netting, then, then it's also a good intervention for exophagic vectors. Actually, a, a good idea. Um, what about pyrus rate? It is an important indicator. So that is more for evaluating the, the control, the vector control interventions. So these ones that I was presenting here are indicators uh, for understanding our vectors and planning how to target them. Uh, par parity rate um, will help us understand a bit whether we are able to uh, have the effect on the vectors that, that we want. So it's a different set of indicators that I didn't include here, but I think it's actually based on seeing this question, it may be useful to circulate these indicators with you as well after the training. The threshold level of differentiate the area in high, medium, low transmission on the basis of the number of female and office mosquitoes per room collected. Difficult, difficult. Uh, if you look at the studies and you look at the human biting rates or the densities uh, and office per room, uh, it is uh, complicated to, to set like universal thresholds, to, to be like, well, above uh, five mosquitoes per room, uh, we are expecting uh, more or less transmission. Because that depends also on whether these mosquitoes are biting humans mainly, or they are also biting animals. Whether these mosquitoes, how, um, what's the proportion of infected mosquitoes of, of those species that you are collecting in the rooms? So the number of mosquitoes alone doesn't always predict transmission. Doesn't always it may help in, in some settings, but doesn't always. How many years we should measure these indicators? How many years we should measure these indicators? Very good question. Uh, in general, at least, I would say at least two years so that you can capture a little bit of the changes that ecological conditions or climatic conditions can cause in the vector population. So uh, a very easy example is a, a dry year, a year with a drought is uh, likely to yield less, less mosquitoes because they don't have breeding sites, while a year with flooding will make the population increase a lot. So if you truly want to get an idea of what's in general terms, the population of an area, it's good to have uh, two or maybe even three years of, uh, of data so that you can control for these climate changes or changes in, in, in the ecology uh, that may be affecting the population of mosquitoes. Um, so yeah, I would say two years. And this is not counting, not, not thinking that you are evaluating an intervention, thinking that what you want to do is to understand the vector population you need to control. Then two indicators, human biting rate and endophagy. We need to use human landing method and there is ethical challenge for this, so it is possible to use another way. Yeah, 
yeah, we, we will talk about the methods in a, in a minute, just in a minute. Sporozoite rates measurement frequency, when we have multiple suspect uh, vectors, may be a female anopheles, may be competent vectors, but they didn't get the chance to be infected. So how we can prove to be vectors? So often, um, hmm. so there is a lot of cases when you suspect uh, a species is a vector, but you haven't been able to detect uh, the infected individual because the proportion of infected uh, mosquitoes of that species is very, is very low. Um, the, the best, uh, from my experience, what I've been doing is I'm, I've been trying to find evidence around me. So if I was working in X country, I was trying to find evidence from the neighboring countries that that vector was infected and see if anybody ha had found one mosquito of that species infected. Because it's true, sometimes it's just not possible to collect enough numbers to detect the, the infected individual. Uh, and what are the WHO recommended, recommended WHO for larva and uh, an adult density interventions? I don't understand that question. Uh, Musa Mohamed Dani, could you maybe type the question again or, or ask the question in the group? Or maybe maybe we leave it for for later for Q and A for when we finish. Let's go into the methods because I see there is a few questions on 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 the methods. Ah, oh, sorry. Let's go first on the larvae because this, this is really short. On the um, entomological indicators for immature stages, which is larvae and pupae, and then we go into the methods. So these ones I just uh, included three. Uh, there are many, and there are many more if we are talking about Aedes. So probably you've seen some of them in previous presentations from from other colleagues. But these are the, the main ones for Anopheles. Uh, although we have to, to think that larvae siding is not a core intervention for Anopheles, right? We, you've seen the, the core interventions yesterday with Jenny, with my colleague Jenny, uh, and the main ones are RLIN and IRS. Larvae siding is a supplementary intervention. But which are the indicators that could help us uh, implement this intervention? Uh, it could be a habitat positivity rate, and I put there in a slash container positivity rate, because when we talk about Aedes, because of the type of breeding sites, we often talk about container positivity rate. When we talk about Anopheles, we talk more often about habitat positivity rate, but they are in, the, in essence the same thing. So this is gonna help us, see, if we sample uh, X number of habitats and then we record the ones that are positive, it's gonna help us do two things. It's gonna help us identify what habitats are actually breeding sites, so in which ones we find uh, larvae and pupae. And then out of the different types of breeding sites that we have, uh, which types of habitats are more frequently uh, occupied by these larvae or pupae? Those will be the more relevant ones because if uh, X type of habitat is, contains larvae more often, it's probably the preferred habitat of uh, our vector species. And, and we can think of targeting that habitat when we do larvae siding. The other one is uh, density, which is also in line uh, with the same question of knowing which are the most important uh, breeding sites. So for a specific breeding site, we can check how many of these type of breeding sites are contain larvae and pupae, and how many larvae and pupae we have per uh, breeding site of that type to understand which are the most relevant uh, breeding sites. Um, and then habitat density, Maybe, maybe this is a less known um, uh, indicator, but is how many breeding sites we have. Because uh, I don't know if you've read WHO uh, guidance, old guidance, that says uh, breeding, in order to implement larvae siding, we have to find, uh, the, the breeding sites need to be few, uh, findable, right? So few and findable, um, and the density has to be enough to actually uh, be able to implement the intervention because we can't not expect uh, probably to have enough resources to get field, to field teams to walk and walk miles and miles and miles to find each of the breeding sites we want to treat. So when breeding sites are more concentrated, they are findable and they are few, uh, you, won't, you can uh, think uh, of the feasibility that, that larvae siding may be more feasible. 